Big brothers, little children, stuffed bears. Bullies come in all shapes and sizes. From Top Gun to Harry Potter, these are the biggest movie jerks of all time. Most movie jerks are at least usually confined to a single character, but when you bring a DeLorean that can traverse time itself into the equation, things get a whole lot more complex. Whether it's 1955 or 1985, the character of Biff Tannen is the typical bully, terrorizing everyone who gets in his way with a horde of lackeys at his side. A violent, womanizing scumbag, Biff nearly manages to undo Marty McFly's very existence in the first Back to the Future film. Things take an especially dark turn, though, after Marty and Doc take a trip to the far future of 2015. When Marty recklessly picks up a sports almanac detailing the results of every major sporting event for the past 50 years, it winds up in Biff's hands, who goes back in time to make his past self unfathomably rich. He uses his vast wealth to create a dystopian reality in which he's the sole ruler of Hill Valley, even revealing to Marty that he killed his father some years prior. While Marty and Doc are able to fix the timeline and undo Biff's reign of terror, it just goes to show that across every conceivable timeline, Biff is an undeniable jerk. Now why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? While he isn't the only bully from the world of witchcraft and wizardry, Draco Malfoy managed to be one of the most persistently annoying characters throughout the entire Harry Potter franchise. While his antics were innocent enough during the first few films, he went down a truly dark path over the events of the eight films. Belonging to the Slytherin house, Draco was practically doomed to be a bad apple from before he even set foot in Hogwarts. The Malfoy family's belief that only those of pure blood should continue the practice of wizardry rubbed off on young Draco, and it became a prejudice he would carry for much of his life. As the Battle of Hogwarts approached, Draco would find himself fully believing in the mission of the Death Eaters, becoming one himself. Even though he started to have a change of heart towards the end, by that point it was too little too late, as he still played a part in the death of Dumbledore. Even though he wasn't always the worst, you can't deny Draco was one of the most enduring jerks in the Harry Potter story. The first feature film to have the distinction of being entirely computer animated, Toy Story is an impressive feat of artistry for the time that it came out. It's also a compelling story that has endured an audience's heart since its 1995 release. Focused on the life of a group of sentient toys led by the Sheriff Woody, the entire status quo is shaken when a new toy, Buzz Lightyear, is unwrapped on their owner's birthday. As the two feud get lost and are subsequently found by the next door neighbor, Sid, things can't get that bad, right? Well, when the kid next door is a sadistic maniac who tears toys apart and puts them back together, things can get pretty awful. Between strapping a rocket to Buzz, burning a hole in Woody's head, and keeping an aggressive dog roaming the halls, ready to tear the duo limb from limb, Sid's behavior made for a toy's living nightmare. Thankfully, Woody and Buzz were able to rally Sid's other toys together and teach the kid a lesson, while also probably giving him more than a few nightmares to boot. So play nice. While John Hammond's rationale to open a park featuring giant carnivorous dinosaurs is definitely questionable, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone who could really call his kind-hearted character a jerk. The sloppy, self-centered computer scientist Dennis Nedry, on the other hand, is pretty much universally hated by everyone who enjoyed this Spielberg classic. Nedry's own greed winds up being the catalyst for the park's destruction. After he accepts a bribe to sneak out a number of dino embryos, he disables the park's security, using it as cover to carry out his theft. It ultimately ends up biting him, though, when his own reckless actions pin him against the hostile Dilaposaurus and he meets an unsavory demise. His stupidity isn't just confined to getting himself killed, though as pretty much the entire failure of the park, as well as its subsequent deaths, can be pinned on this self-serving jerk. Focused on the day-to-day -day doldrums and the insanity that results from a 9-to-5 job, Office Space has become an iconic movie since its 1999 release for everything it had to say about the American office lifestyle. At the heart of it all is Bill Lumberg, the division vice president of the Initech software company and the embodiment of your typical office drum. Another cog in the machine, his incessant pestering of every employee at the company perfectly encapsulates the soul-crushing nature of a job we're all too familiar with. The monotone delivery of every asinine order he gives only further drives his employees away from him. I'm going to have to go ahead and sort of disagree with you there. The most visible example is Peter's complete disregard for office etiquette and protocol throughout the film as a result of Lumberg's nagging. The most dramatic reaction, though, comes at the climax of the film. After repeatedly having his stapler stolen and his cubicle relocated, Milton makes good on his promise to burn the office to the ground as revenge. Hitting theaters in 1986, this sarcastic coming-of-age comedy was a huge hit upon release, grossing over ten times its budget. It has since gone on to be immortalized in the hearts of everyone who's given this classic comedy a try with its free-spirited message. 
A normal teen comedy would rely on the authority figure to be the one stifling everyone's fun, which Principal Ed Rooney does throughout the film. But surprisingly, the worst offender to the friend group winds up being Ferris Bueller himself. To be fair, almost everyone who's been to high school has likely lied to get out of class at least once. But Ferris doesn't stop at just truancy. He convinces his best friend Cameron into letting them take his father's Ferrari for a joyride around Chicago, and promptly then backburners him to spend time with his girlfriend. Ferris isn't the one who straight up kicks the prized car through a glass window at the end of the film. But if he had just been a little more considerate to his friends, none of that would have ever happened. After his success in Risky Business and Legend, Tom Cruise became the star of 80s action classic Top Gun, playing a naval fighter pilot who goes by the callsign Maverick. The macho personalities and unending bravado needed to be a fighter pilot are on full display throughout the events of the film. No one has a greater sense of confidence than Iceman, the top student at the Top Gun Naval Fighters Weapons School. While Iceman might be justified in some of his actions in the movie, it doesn't change the fact that his smug self-satisfaction kind of makes everyone hate his guts. The fact that he tends to be right most of the time just makes him even more dislikable. The majority of the jerks on this list never find themselves getting any kind of redemption arc with those they've wronged, but Top Gun bucks the trend, with both Maverick and Iceman seen eye to eye by the end of the film. Sure, Kevin might be the main character of this iconic 1990 comedy, and sure, he was justified in defending his home from an attempted burglary. Still, it doesn't make his treatment of the two thieves that tried to break in any less sadistic. And while his older brother Buzz McAllister was a bully, at least he didn't gamble with an attempted murder charge on a couple of low-life crooks. Whether he was setting fires, leaving nails on stairs, or hurling paint cans at the wet bandits' heads, Kevin definitely crossed the line on what's acceptable self-defense more than a few times. He never even looks all that scared, even when Harry and Marv are inside the family house. Instead, he derives some sick pleasure from watching the pair fall victim to another one of his traps. When he finds himself once again being pursued by the bandits in New York City, he launches bricks at Harry and even winds up electrocuting him at one point. Now, he didn't get anyone killed with all his violence as a mystery. Adapted from the classic children's novel, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory has become a cinema classic since its release. The beloved Gene Wilder would steal the show. His character, Willy Wonka, took a group of children, each with their own distinct personalities, down a rabbit hole of the bizarre in this 1971 film. Now, every kid who was invited to Willy Wonka's surreal factory was at least a bit of a brat in their own way, with even Charlie Bucket being coerced into stealing one of Wonka's many wonders. However, it's none other than Veruca Salt that has the unenviable title of biggest jerk in the cinema classic. Her constant whining and youthful snobbery helped make her a detestable character from the start. Eventually, it all comes to a head when she's deservedly thrown down a garbage chute in Wonka's golden egg room. Now a timeless classic in its genre, the 1984 comedy Ghostbusters is well known for having just about each and every one of its characters being a jerk in their own right. Peter Venkman himself almost takes the title for the worst in this film, with his lust for money being his biggest motivator in life. However, he's edged out by Walter Peck, the EPA inspector with a grudge against Venkman starting almost the second they meet. You can have it your way, Mr. Venkman. After he sees a containment device a group is using to house the captured spirits and is rebuked by Venkman, Peck returns with the law in hand. His own arrogance and distrust for the Ghostbusters lead him to order the containment unit be shut off. This is much to the dismay of the paranormal exterminators and even the electrician Peck brought along with him. The resulting explosion unleashes a maelstrom of ghosts upon Manhattan, with the blame resting squarely at Peck's feet. Tearing apart old toys you don't even know are alive is one thing, but sentencing the entire cast of characters we've all grown to love for over two decades to a fiery death is another thing entirely. Lotso Hugging Bear, or Lotso for short, tricked Woody, Buzz, and the rest of the gang at first with his endearing personality. But it didn't take long for this deceptive bear to pull the rug out from under our heroes with his dictator-like style of leadership. After attempting to let Buzz into his inner circle at the daycare, Lotso refuses Buzz's insistence that his friends be allowed to come with him. Things quickly take a turn for the worse, as Lotso shows his darker side by resetting Buzz's memory and turning him into just another one of his minions. As the plot progresses and the rest of the toys attempt to escape the prison-like daycare, they find themselves headed straight for a garbage incinerator alongside the bright pink bear. Even though they push him to safety, Lotso refuses to return the favor, effectively dooming the group to a fiery death before they're saved at the last second. While some of his actions might be less evil than the majority of jerks on our list, you'll be hard-pressed to find many characters whose names are synonymous with being a buzzkill. First appearing in the 1966 animated film How the Grinch Stole Christmas, this yuletide menace has terrorized the Christmas spirit for over 50 years. Actors such as Boris Karloff, Jim Carrey, and even Benedict Cumberbatch all lending their talent to bring this mischievous character to life. Created by the beloved children's author Dr. Seuss, the character of the Grinch is a mean-spirited and cynical creature who despises nothing more than the merriment and festivities 
festivities of Christmas. Every rendition of the now classic story sees him living atop a nearby mountain while doing everything in his power to ruin the holiday cheer for the residents below him in Booville. His plans reach a climax as he gathers every present and piece of Christmas cheer he can find on Christmas Eve with the intent to destroy it, before having a change of heart at the last second come Christmas morning. While most retellings of this timeless story over the years have been animated, Jim Carrey's live-action version in 2000 was memorable, to say the least. The Grinch. In what's arguably one of comedian and actor Adam Sandler's best films to date, his 1996 comedy saw Sandler as the titular Happy Gilmore, an outsider with a huge tax bill to pay and a knack for the sport of golf. He proves his mettle at a small tournament, earning entry into a professional tour that has enough prize money to settle his financial burden. As Happy continues barreling towards the title of champion, another professional player, Shooter McGavin, is less than pleased to see a total newbie play at his level. McGavin becomes determined to throw Gilmore off by any means necessary, hiring people to harass him and even trying to flat-out buy his competitor out of the sport for good. Despite the temptation, Gilmore pushes through, determined to beat McGavin in his own game and ultimately win the title of champion from the egotistical and childish McGavin. You'd think a film with a lead that sounds ready to cut a summer camp full of teens to bits would have its titular character be the biggest baddie. But those who have watched this Tim Burton classic know better than that. While the titular Scissorhands is nothing but kind-hearted toward those around him, even falling in love with a girl he lives with named Kim, her boyfriend Jim is nothing but nasty to Edward. Jim repeatedly tries to turn the people in town against Edward, first setting him up to get arrested during a burglary and then startling him into cutting Kim with his hands. After Kim breaks up with Jim as a result of his constant harassment, things take a turn for the worse as Jim vows to get his revenge on Edward. In the final confrontation at Edward's old mansion, Jim's true colors are revealed when he slaps Kim across the face, causing Edward to finally snap and stab Jim to death, and not a moment too soon. Sure, for most of his time at Hogwarts, Draco Malfoy was nothing but a constant thorn in the side of Harry and pretty much everyone else who he interacts with. But he's a kid, so he gets a pass on at least a few things. The cat-loving and sickeningly pink Dolores Umbridge, on the other hand, doesn't get any forgiveness from us. Her smug, self-righteous attitude only does more harm than good, as she rises to become the headmistress of Hogwarts during Harry's fifth year. During her reign, she was unusually harsh, enacting strict punishments on students left and right, a prime example of which is when she tortured Harry by forcing him to write an apology into his own flesh. To make matters even worse, she weakened the entire student body by crippling their study of defense against the dark arts, helping to set up the disasters that would soon befall the school. Her snooty, controlling, and unbelievably cruel attitude only made it that much more satisfying watching her get dragged into the woods by centaurs. Before he would direct Ferris Bueller's Day Off, John Hughes would create Weird Science, an oddball teen comedy that starred the socially awkward Gary and Wyatt. The friend duo decides to create a real woman named Lisa, Frankenstein style. Always nearby is Wyatt's domineering older brother Chet, whose sole purpose in life is to make Wyatt's life a living hell. While Lisa's purpose is to look over the two boys, she can't prevent much of Chet's harassment towards the duo. Not yet, at least. <laughs> Between his constant extortion of his younger brother, name-calling, and comically violent behavior, it's no wonder the two leads try to hide their supernatural creation from Chet. Things come to a head when he busts down a door and sticks a shotgun in Gary's face. After Chet forces Gary and Wyatt out of the house with their girlfriends in hand, Lisa decides enough is enough and turns his tyrannical nutcase into a giant, disgusting blob monster. You could say someone's true colors only show when they're put into a stressful situation, and that couldn't be more true when your stressor is a mysterious and thick mist that no one returns from. Adapted from a Stephen King novella of the same name, the paths of people of a small town converge in a small supermarket in this 2007 horror film. From there, things turn even more bizarre as hordes of creatures assault the small building and its occupants. In your typical horror movie fair, the cohesion of the group is put to the test, ultimately winding up being a worse lot than the giant bugs that they're trying to fend off. One particularly wicked member of the bunch, Mrs. Carmody, views the whole situation as the wrath of God, whipping her followers into a cult-like fervor and leading them into committing human sacrifice. And the movie only gets more brutal from there. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies and TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.